How you doing today? Today we want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about some of the basics of sports sociology. Specifically, we're going to be looking at people in sports as compared to individuals in sports that we did in the last section of, of lectures. Sports inherently are activities that are very social. They're related to the cultural context in which we live every single day, but sports also provide a way to understand the stories and the images and how that's connected with culture. Sport essentially provides us an opportunity to look at the window into a culture or society. For example, think about professional tennis. In Wimbledon, which is held in England, the event is very different. Not just the surface of the actual tennis court, but the environment around it. The players at Wimbledon have the dress code of wearing white, and fan participation and behavior is very conservative. Compare and contrast that with the US Open, which is much more of a, a rock and roll type of environment with loud music and the crowd gets very loud and you tend to have blimps and, and there's just much more of a visual and audio presence at the US Open as compared to Wimbledon. Ultimately, it's still professional tennis and many of the same participants participate in these two tennis tournaments. But what that, those tennis tournaments allow us to do is see differences in these two respective cultures. I really like it when sport managers or people that are going to be working in sport, recreation, and physical activity look at and utilize social science. Specifically in regards to sociology, what I'd like everyone to really understand and focus on is how embedded sport is in the social, political, and economic conditions of a particular culture. By understanding who is participating and why they are participating in specific for sports or forms of physical activity, that can actually help our industry and our organizations grow and provide better products and services. For the entire course, we want to understand how and why people associate with sport. To do that, again, we're drawing from psychology which helps us to understand the individual. We're going to draw from social psychology to understand more about group contexts. But in this particular section, we're going to draw from sociology primarily to understand the social context of which fan, participant, or other business-related aspects of sport, how they interact and how they behave. What is sociology? For a definition, think of it as just simply the scientific study of social interactions in social organizations. Within those two words, interactions and organization, though, we'll find that there are a lot of different ways and a lot of different complex ideas that need to be fleshed out. To understand sociology, sometimes we take a, what's called a micro point of view. We tend to focus more on small groups, perhaps even a little bit of, indi of the individual. Or you can contrast that by looking at a macro point of view. Sociology primarily was concerned with the macro point of view, which involves something like society or culture. What is a society then? If sociology is looking at studying you know, one way that we organize ourselves as people, society is one way of doing that. And that has a lot to do with people living in a very, very similar geographical area. So when we talk about American society, we talk about the, ge the geography that's associated with the United States of America. One of the most important ideas that came out of sociology was developed by C. Wright Mills in the 1950s. And all he did was he articulated what he called the sociological imagination. And it's the ability for us to see our own personal experiences and how they are related to larger patterns in society. So if you enjoy a particular game or sport, for example, the game of American football, if you enjoy football, being able to see that your love of this game is something that you share with millions and millions and millions of other people, not just in the United States, but also globally. That's an example of sociological imagination. You, you oftentimes hear that sport is a microcosm of a particular society. And what does this mean? It means that sport represents the larger society that it's embedded within. 
here in the United States, we tend to see organized team sport and other aspects of, of physical activity as positive things. And this was articulated in the early to mid-1970s by a very famous sports sociologist, Harry Edwards. He called it the dominant American sport creed. And basically, he said that sport, participating in sport, provided discipline, an understanding of competition, the ability to build character, mental and physical fitness, an understanding of religion, and nationalism. So nationalistic pride, such as being proud to be an American. And he said oftentimes the people that are glorified, especially athletes that are glorified, oftentimes they represent or reflect these characteristics of the dominant American sport creed. And a question to kind of think about moving forward, yes, we know that the popular assumption in the United States is that sports are positive and they help to build things like character and work ethic. But take a moment and ask and then answer this question. Does sport promote any negative values? If so, what are they? Oftentimes, as we start talking about sports sociology, it becomes very important for everyone to have the same vocabulary. Specifically, what is a sport? Now, this definition is obviously very complicated, very convoluted, but our understanding of sport is going to be bolstered if we're all working with the same type of definition. So we rely on Dr. Jay Coakley, whom is one of the foremost sports sociologists in the world. He said that sports really are institutionalized competitive activities involving rigorous physical exertion or the use of a relatively complex physical skill by participants that are motivated by internal or external rewards. What does this mean? All right, let's break it down. Sports are institutionalized competitive activities. All right, institutionalized meaning that it's common within a particular society or culture. Okay, competitive, how you define competition, we seek that answer from American culture. Okay, so these institutionalized competitive activities involve rigorous physical exertion or a relatively complex physical skill. Is throwing darts, is that a sport? By this definition, yes it is. The final part of the definition is that the participants that are involved in these institutionalized competitive activities that maybe involve a lot of physical activity or some sort of complex physical skill, these individuals are motivated to be a part of these sports by internal or external rewards. Maybe externally they receive um, payment for their participation. Internally they feel satisfaction or gratification for participating. Now what this definition is, there's a lot of jargon, a lot of words there, but ultimately what this definition means is it's very flexible. So think about things such as cheerleading. If you think about NCAA or cheerleading in the intercollegiate athletic environment, is that a sport? Some say yes, some say no. There's a Supreme Court case that one university, Quinnipiac, um, was trying to count cheerleading for Title IX purposes. The Supreme Court eventually said that no, it did not necessarily count as a sport, but only in regards to Title IX compliance. So if you are engaging in cheerleading activities, then you have to look at, to define whether it's a sport, you have to look at the social environment, and that's ultimately what we think about. An activity isn't necessarily good or bad. It's not necessarily a sport or not a sport. It's if it satisfies some of these criteria that we've already identified. And to really understand that, we look at the social environment. So let's think about another kind of focus area of the sociology of sport. We talked about it. It was about organization. So 
how people organize themselves. Well, we know that there's society and culture and those types of things. But there's also, let's focus on how sport is physically, logistically organized. We know modern sport is much more complex than it has been in previous decades, previous uh, centuries. And so to understand and really kind of flesh out that structure, let's think about what sociology of sport can provide. And it provides focus. So three different areas, different ways for understanding how sport is organized is through the institution and organization aspect. And this is going to be your larger organizations. Uh, if you're talking about something like putting on a global event like the FIFA's World Cup, or the Summer and Winter Olympics. That's usually involving institutions and a multitude of organizations. Another way to think about it is through what they call microsystems. Okay? And so if we're talking about a women's professional basketball team or league in a particular country, you're not necessarily looking at all of the professional basketball teams in that country. You're looking at women's professional basketball teams in that particular country or culture. Okay, so that's microsystem. And then finally you have subcultures. And subcultures may transcend different types of organizations uh, just with the, the prefix sub, meaning it's probably not going to be uh, mainstream and extremely popular. If you think about sport gambling and fantasy sports and things like that, while very popular, uh, there are a great number of fans and athletes that are involved in, in heavily consumed sport that are not involved in di different types of sport gambling. So those are three just different ways of thinking about how sport is going to be not just organized, but also how we can start to relate to and understand sport. Theories really help us to do this. If we understand and identify the structure, okay, then the interaction within those structures, how do we understand that? Theories help us ask the question and help to see the way the world is and how people relate to it. Uh, if we want to describe, if we want to reflect or really examine and understand sport and its impact on people, theories provide us ways of doing that. They also help us make decisions. There are practical implications for thinking about and using theories moving forward. Now there are a large number of theories within sociology that can be applied to the sociology of sport. I've chosen to try to keep it as parsimonious and slim as possible. And so we're going to focus primarily on structural level theories and then constructionist theories. Within those paradigms you have a couple of theories that we'll talk about. You don't need to know everything about these theories, but you need to know the basics and how they can help to view sport, understand people's interaction with sport, and how these ultimately how these theories explain some of the issues that arise within the world of sport. The next few slides we're going to be talking about structural theories. Now might be a good time to pause this pr presentation and maybe take a small break. If you took a small break and you're joining us again, thank you for coming back. And as a brief review, we're talking about theories so that we can really understand how people interact with sport, recreation, and physical activity. There are two sort of large typologies of theories that we're going to talk about. The first one are structural theories. And structural theories deal with large-scale things or phenomena. This might actually include something like sport participation rates. So if you think about the number of NCAA student-athletes from the mid-80s to you know, 2014, 2015, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of participants. Or if you're talking about uh, physical activity rates in the United States of children under the age of 12, those are going to be participation rates, and those are great examples of large-scale things, a macro-level approach for understanding social interaction in sport. One structural th structuralist theory that we'll talk about is called functionalism. You also might hear it called structural functionalism. And it basically says that society is organized almost like a, either an organism 
like a living entity or being, or think of it as I drive a truck, so I oftentimes I think about it as the engine of the truck, and that's the way society is organized. Everything has to work together. Sport is just one institution within society. It's one part of that system. And so what functionalism allows us to do is understand sport participation and really the positive outcomes that being involved in sport can have for both individuals and society. Some of these ideas that are associated with positivity. The notion of solidarity or unity. This is something that's big within a structural functionalist point of view. You know, oftentimes when you think about unity, you think about a sense of oneness. And that togetherness, oftentimes, when we talk about different aspects of sport, that's something in American culture that's promoted. The other aspect of sport is maybe as a role model. So think about how professional athletes are oftentimes involved in their communities. And they're involved in their communities in a variety of different ways. But we look to high-profile people in our communities as a way of representing the values that are important to us as a nation, as a community, and as a group of people. Functionalism is very popular and oftentimes it's sort of the underlying lens that the sport media uses to approach and understand sports. However, there are some weaknesses to employing a functionalist point of view to understand sport and how people are associated with sport. One is that it overstates the positive consequences of sport. It assumes that all people that participate in sports are going to benefit equally from that participation, and we know that that's just simply not true. It also does not recognize that sports are what we call social constructions, meaning that sports are activities that may privilege or disadvantage some people more than others. And this kind of goes back to the idea that one's participating in a sport is not the same experience for every single person. Some people participate in sports because it's a way to transcend their economic realities and they need a scholarship to go to college or maybe they need a professional contract so they can help give money back to their family, their community, those types of things. So sports are not equal for everyone. Another way to look at a structure, structuralist view of sport is what we call conflict theory. Conflict theory sees society as a system of relationships or structures that are associated primarily with economic forces. When you think conflict theory, you're going to think power and money. Sports, as a result, are going to be looked at and tried to be understood in the terms of economics and exploitation. And so you can really start to see when people talk about exploitation within intercollegiate athletics, Oftentimes, they're using a conflict view or conflict theory orientation. What they really like to do is focus on how sports perpetuate the power and privilege of certain specific elite groups in a particular society. For example, we do know that professional athletes make a lot of money. But what about the owners of professional franchises? What about the commissioners? Of professional sports. These people make exponentially more money. All right, so conflict theory is going to be focused on the idea of not just aggregate dollars, but really how much are you putting into sport and what you're getting out of it. And that's the basis for understanding exploitation. Truthfully, though, many people do not like a conflict theory point of view because it, it's very negative. It identifies a lot of problems in society and then it applies those problems to the world of sport. It's seldom used in everyday conversation because it portrays sport as a distraction from, from the awareness of social issues. Karl Marx, oftentimes associated with a conflict view from sociology, said that Religion was opium for the masses in that it anesthetized us 
so that we did not see the day-to-day -day struggle and inequities. Okay? Well, that's not necessarily our focus today. But Frank DeFord, a very well-respected Sports Illustrated, HBO Real Sports, a very well-respected uh, sport journalist, also a former student athlete at his time in the 50s in, in Princeton, I believe he played basketball. Uh, he actually took that Karl Marx point of view and applied it to sport. And he said, sport is the opiate of the masses. So instead of thinking about people going hungry or how we can help out our community on Thanksgiving, he said a lot of people sit down and watch football all day long. And so it, what sport does is it distracts us from some of the problems in society. Also, what he said was that because of the entertainment aspect of sport, that entertainment aspect just, it really anesthetizes us or keeps us from really understanding the problems, the social problems within sport and within our industry. Student athlete exploitation in intercollegiate athletics is a, is a great example of people that use a conflict theory point of view. Now, conflict theory obviously has its weaknesses as well. And one is this almost exclusive focus on economics. It ignores the importance of other factors, such as gender, race, ethnicity, age, or maybe just the want of people to participate in sport and physical activity. It really it loses sight of the fact that sport can be a personally and socially empowering experience for individuals or groups of people. Lastly, we want to talk about feminist theories. Feminist theories, there are a lot of them, so we're just going to talk about in general. Um, and what feminism tends to do is focus on the fact that there are gendered experiences within society, and that those gendered experiences bleed over into understanding sport. When we look at masculinity, when we look at definitions of femininity, if we look at understanding sexual orientation or sexuality or values associated with masculinity and femininity, that is what feminist theories tend to focus on. When you think about physicality and what it means to be to have a, a an appropriate body image or what people are looking for in terms of entertainment as sport and entertainment have come closer and closer together we see that the same expectations that we have out of other entertainment venues such as movies and music and TV shows we have those expectations within sport and so if masculinity and femininity are associated with different attributes such as competition, so if masculinity tends to be associated with competition and aggressiveness, then women that are aggressive and competitive are adopting masculine characteristics according to this sort of social point of view. So where do they fit in? How do we understand this? And that's what feminist theories are trying to look at and understand. Obviously an, a gendered view of sport is a very, very appropriate and important way for examining sports. However, there are some weaknesses associated with feminist theories. And one is that there are so many different feminist theories that we really lack clear guidelines for understanding and assessing forms of resistance and the value of ideas and actions in producing social transformation. So if we want to address a uh, sexist view in sport, maybe a promotional campaign that exploits a female image. How do we go about challenging that? Another weakness of feminist theories is that, oddly enough, and, and, and a lot of feminist research is trying to change this now, is that they have not given enough attention to the connections between gender and other categories of experiences, such as race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, etc., etc., one thing that's going to be really important is that to adopt a feminist point of view or to look at and understand issues involving gender and sport does not mean that you have to dislike men or you have to 
disagree with how things have been portrayed in sport media currently. What it does mean is that you're looking critically and understanding how these sport entertainment events, what are some of the aspects that may be sexist. Not all aspects may be sexist, but some may be. And how do we go about assessing that, understanding that? Again, we're going to be shifting gears here, so if you want to take a break, then please go ahead and press pause, and we'll talk a little bit more about the last category of social theories in sports sociology. If you stuck with me, then we want to talk about constructionist theories. And constructionist theories are basically the opposite of what we just spoke about in structuralist theories. These are smaller scale phenomena. So if you think about a subculture like fans of a particular team, why do fans wear what they wear? Why do they paint their faces? Why do we tailgate? Why do, why do fans go so crazy and just let out all those emotions at a sporting event? These types of social theories that we're going to talk about tend to address those smaller questions. Symbolic interactionism, or interactionism, says that society is created and maintained through understanding the social interactions that we as people have. And so sports are a reflection of that, are studied in terms of how they create and give meaning to people. So when people say, I am a sport fan, I am, I am an owner of the Green Bay Packers, I am a lifelong fan of the Green Bay Packers, that, that means something to me personally. And that can be important for people that are part of sport, recreation, and physical activity management because we want to understand how different experiences of sport are associated with our identities as people and how this may manifest itself in sport participation or actually participation in some sort of sport culture. Those who use and try to understand how we as individuals relate to a sport oftentimes are going to employ what we call interpretive research methods. We talked about this previously in this course, but what interpretive research methods try to do is understand instead of numbers and percentages, they try to understand the social processes associated with, with meaning, with identity, with, with subculture, and how and why we become involved in sports to begin with, why we stay involved or why we may change our involvement in sports throughout the years. Symbolic interactionism was, the, was one of the first interactionist theories. And it basically said that social inter interaction is possible because of the manipulation, evolution, and creation of symbols. That's how we as people really interact. And we've talked about this before. A symbol is something that stands for something else. That's it. And so some of these theorists early on, you had Dr. Mead, who was a psychologist, and what he really talked a lot about was uh, how people would work together. And you tried to understand and predict what other people were going to do, and he used a lot of sport examples. Herbert Bloomer, who was actually one of Mead's students, and who helped to develop symbolic interactionism, played college and professional football. I just thought it was kind of nice. It was, it's sort of interesting. We don't have a lot of theories um, in sociology that are directly connected to sports, but, but Herbert Bloomer did play briefly for the Chicago Bears in the NFL. Symbolic interactionism, one of the things that's really interesting about it is that it's very simple. There's three basic assumptions, and this is how we try to understand this association that people have with sports. One, we respond to things in our environment based on their meanings or the understandings that we have. So if you are a Dallas Cowboys fan, that star on the side of the helmet of the Dallas Cowboys is something important to you. To other people that are not fans or, or maybe if they're not rivals and they just don't care about football, that star is just a star. It's just something painted. So that means the, the meanings that we have about different symbols in life, there's nothing inherently good or bad about them. And that's what makes it a social construction. The meaning, the connection that people have with symbols is constantly changing. Those are the three basic assumptions of symbolic interactionism. And it says those three things, if you understand those three things, 
then you will understand how we experience the social world, or what they call our constructed reality. Is a professional football game a big event? Yes, if you are a fan of professional football. If you are not a fan of professional football, then that event isn't that important to you. If you like opera more so than the NFL, then maybe the Super Bowl isn't all that important to you, or vice versa. Some of the weaknesses of interaction. It doesn't really explain how these personal meanings and identities and things like that are connected with the larger social structures in society. It tends to focus more on the individual. So let's talk about CrossFit. Um, and that's a, that's a great example of subcultures. And the, the connection, the meaning, the association, the identity that people have with with being in a CrossFit box, the, the gyms where they work out, and they push themselves, and they push themselves. All right? Symbolic interactionism can help us understand that, how and why they do that, but it doesn't, it doesn't really help us connect CrossFit to you know, sport participation patterns or American culture, things like that. Also, symbolic interactionism tends to ignore or overlook issues of power. So if we're going back to the CrossFit experience, how and why you're involved is a very personal thing. But let it but symbolic interactionism doesn't talk about how CrossFit as a cultural mechanism does wield some power in American society and, and globally as well. There, there are large decisions being made every single day that are calculated, that are associated with how how CrossFit's going to be produced as a product, how it's going to be commodified, how it's going to be sold to the American or global masses so that it can be a very um, efficient and productive financial force. The last theories we want to talk about in regard to interactionism are Bergen and Corfing. And these are kind of interesting because in the mid-1970s, researchers started talking about Berging. What does Berging mean? It means basking in reflective glory. And what they noticed on college campuses is that students, they actually wore team apparel on the Mondays after a football win on Saturday. And so this is where you get the we. We, we played a great game. We won. We were part of it. Well, hmm, about 15 years later, we started to look at the other side of it. Yes, we know that fan identity and self-worth were really covered in this basking in reflective glory, and that was a very powerful idea, but what happens, what happens if our team did not win on Saturday? Our college football team didn't win. What happens that following Monday? Well, you did not have people wear nearly as much team apparel. And so research beginning in the late 80s and the early 90s came up with this idea of corfing or cutting off reflective failure where if the team lost you generally didn't say we lost the game you say the Packers lost or we won the Super Bowl say those are examples of basking in reflective glory or cutting off reflective failure they're very important they, they help to explain a lot but there's a lot of holes. It doesn't explain a lot of aspects of sport dynamics. It focuses almost exclusively on fans, and we don't necessarily have a clear definition of what constitutes a fan. Are we talking about a casual fan? Are we talking about kind of an in-depth aligned fan? Uh, it does not adequately explain more marginalized sport experiences. It tends to focus more on mainstream types of sports. So. While it does provide, it, what Bergen and Corfin really do, though, is it really connects social theories to other disciplines such as marketing, communication, consumer behavior, those types of things. We've covered a lot of ground in this particular Basics of Sports Sociology lecture. There's a lot of information to digest, but I want to take in a few points and just try to wrap up everything as succinctly as possible. 
one, we use sociology to understand people in sports because it's already developed. It's a legitimate scientific point of view that already has theories and modes of analysis, things like that. It allows us to understand groups of people in sport, recreation, and physical activity. And it helps to see how sports relate to or impact individuals, people. It also helps us to see how sports may impact a society or culture or what we'll talk about more in the future, a community. The way that we can really do and examine these connections, whether it's in regards to how people behave or, or why they participate or, or why they connect or are involved in sport, we can utilize the social theories. Ultimately, what we do know is that the more you know about a community, then the more you know about people. And the more you know about people, the more you can connect your sport, your products, your services with them. And ultimately, those that are involved in sport, recreation, and physical activity,